the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind. To him, uh, Psalm 136, to him by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters. People go, laid out the earth above the waters. We don't understand that. Well, you can if you think that he's talking about the crust of the earth being laid out above the waters. And then, this is out of Peter. This is, this is a verse from Peter where it says, for this they willfully forget, the, the non-believers of the last days, this is talking about now, they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old. God created the heavens and the earth standing out of water and in the water. So the earth that we, the, the pre-flood earth was standing out of the water, there was dry land, but the pre-flood earth was also standing in the water. Standing in the water with pillars sticking down through waters trapped underneath the crust uh, prior to the flood by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. So Peter is saying the, the land was out of the water, land was in the water, and that water came out to flood the earth is, is really what is being said uh, in Second Peter. So going back to New American Standard, uh, verse 1, 9 through 10, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear and it was so. And the next, just, just this next animation, just before we started here, um, I, I just want to say this again is the crust has been placed between the two waters, and now it's been animated by Eric to show the fact that the crust would flow, and it's hard to imagine rock flowing, but again, it's hard to imagine 60,000 pounds per square inch and the unbalances there, so the rock would have flowed, dropping pillars down onto the mantle, creating areas for the water to go into to let the dry land appear, and we'll just take in this animation. And so it's, and I, I asked him to slow it down so that in the discussion, and this would have been, this would have created a tremendous amount of heat actually while it's doing this, and there would have been melting of of metals, there would have been melting of everything in the granitic crust that it, the, the lowest melting thing is the quartz in the crust and it would have melted out, iron and nickel would have melted out, concentrated at the pillars and these pillars would have been hot. This is, the next one is a side view of a cubic, you know, kind of looking at a cube of the earth, also showing the pillars going down, the dry land appearing and the seas appearing as the pillars drop down. Again, this is theory but it goes along with what the Bible says, and it also goes along with how the flood could have occurred. And uh, so the pillars are dropping down through the water, the dry land appears, and it's very possible that this, the, the earth, the earth before the flood, we see all kinds of huge flora, huge dinosaurs, huge oysters, plant, the, the earth had this incredible amount of vegetation prior to the flood, we know that from from many different ways, you know, we can look at through the fossil record. Because the mountains were much lower, the winds would have been different, the weather would have been different, the, the entire earth would have been much more watered, uh, and we also have from Genesis that the ground was just misting up and watering, and so there was a tremendous amount of vegetation on the earth in a condition of sh uh, shallow seas and not so high mountains. An additional assumption and this isn't really an assumption. This is, this is more of a fact. This is a fact. If this is the way the earth really was, if the theory is correct, then what would have happened is all the waters that are trapped underneath the crust, but all interconnected because these pillars wouldn't have kept one side of the earth's water from moving over to the other side of the earth. It, it is a fact that since the moon was created on the fourth day, the lunar effect of the moon upon the earth would have created tides, a tidal effect, on that subterranean water. In other words, when the moon was close to the near side of the earth, it would be trying to pull the water from the back side of the subterranean chambers to the front side and would have lifted, and, the, and I'm going to say 15 inches, there's a reason for saying 15 inches, it would have lifted the near side crust 15 inches, dropped it back down, lifted it, dropped it back down twice a day because that's how, long, that's how many times we experience a tide now. The average tide of the earth today is 30 inches, why it was 15 inches back then. 
Now, when you lift a 10 mile crust, um, 15 inches, and let it back down, you're talking billions of pounds of mass moving and going back, and work, the, the definition in physics world, work is equal to force through a distance. And it's 15 inches is not much distance, 10 miles of crust is a lot of force. And that work created heat. So the other part of the theory that's recently come together for Dr. Brown has, is not part of the seventh edition book, is that this thermal condition of heating up the water and heating up the pillars as they would have been bouncing off of the mantle as this, this lunar effect was occurring, was adding so much heat to that water that the temperature and pressure of this water is greatly increasing over the 1600 plus years between creation and the flood. And so while everybody's willy-nilly up on topside, uh, you know, getting evil as it turns out to the days of Noah, down deep underneath them, this tidal effect is adding temperature and pressure which is about to become their judgment. And so that's, uh, it's a very important assumption and it, again, it's a fact. <laughs> that if there was water, it would be heating up. There would be a tremendous amount of heat being added to that subterranean water. So now we have to get a little bit really scientific here. <laughs> but there's gonna be some benefit for those uh, moms that have always wondered why a pressure cooker works better. So, so there's supercritical temperature water. Dr. Brown theorizes this temperature increase to the water getting above 705 degrees, which is called supercritical. Water has a saturated temperature and pressure relationship between freezing and 705 degrees. And let me, here's, here's the water. This is actually right to this level is a pint, which I'm going to tell you super critical water. This is worth a half a stick of dynamite in energy is where we're going with this. But if I wanted to boil this water, how hot do I have to get it? Anybody here, any of you science experts here? 212. <laughs> Add atmospheric pressure at sea level, 212 degrees. So as soon as I heat this water up at 212 degrees, it starts boiling because there's 14.7 pounds absolute pressure at atmospheric pressure at sea level, which we're at, that the pressure is trying to keep it from boiling. It's here, we don't feel it because it's all around us. And at 212, it'll start boiling. Well, uh, years ago, just because of people knowing Knowing the effects of water is they invented pressure cookers. This, is, this happens to be Juanita's and ours. And no matter how much, this is the thing for kids, I want to cook this thing, I want to boil this egg a lot faster by turning the heat up. You're not, you're not heating up that egg any faster. No matter how much it's boiling, it's still only 212 degrees. So what you have to do is to make that water boil hotter is you have to pressurize the water. And this is what pressure cookers are. And they make this lid, uh, they make the lid so that it actually goes inside and like this, because it's made to pressurize 10, 15 pounds. If pressure's increased at 10 pounds, it'll boil it at 